The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Then the Jews started arguing with one another. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They said. Jesus replied, I tell you most solemnly, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. As I, who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will draw life from me. This is the bread come down from heaven, not like the bread our ancestors ate. They are dead, but anyone who eats this bread will live forever. Brothers and sisters, the Gospel of the Lord. Some years back, I was the spiritual director of a group of pilgrims to Lutz and Fatima. In our pilgrimage, we went to Portugal, and when we were there, we visited this place named Santarim. This place was known for a Eucharistic miracle. And the story of this Eucharistic miracle goes something like this. There was a woman whose husband was having an affair. Of course, this wife, this woman, was very devastated. But instead of turning to God, instead of turning to her faith, she decided to seek help from a local witch. Now, this witch, after hearing her plight, agreed to help her. But she has a price to pay. And the price was to get a host from the church. So this woman, being a Catholic, she was a little bit distressed, but she pondered for a while, and finally, she, after a lot of hesitation, she agreed to it. So one fine Sunday, she came for Mass like this, and she attended Mass. But while going up to receive communion, when she took the host, instead of eating it, she secretly hid it. And later on, she put in her headscarf, some part in her headscarf. And after Mass, of course, she quickly, hurriedly get out of the church and was on her way back home. But while walking back home, suddenly she felt like something was dripping from her headscarf. And when she looked at it, to her horror, she realized that there was blood there. And she tried to take the host which she hid in her headscarf and she realized that it was a piece of flesh. So she was really, really horrified by this piece of flesh that was oozing blood. And she quickly ran back home and hid this piece of flesh at the corner of her home. And that night, she actually suddenly saw this bright light coming from a part of a house. And when she was investigating, she realized that it was actually coming 
from the host, the place where she placed the flesh and blood. And of course, she couldn't hide this reality anymore. She informed the husband that this is a Eucharist that turned into a real flesh and blood. So both of them knelt down and prayed very hard. Now this news very soon spread to the neighbors and spread to the town. And this place started becoming, became very well known for this Eucharist, Eucharistic miracle. Whether this couple finally you know, reconciled, we actually didn't quite know from the story. But what became apparent was this place, Santorim, through the years became a very famous pilgrimage place for the Eucharistic miracle. Now, of course, the pilgrims, when we were there, in knowing this reality, they were all very reverent in uh, adoring this this Eucharist that turned into the flesh and blood. It, the actual uh, Eucharist was placed in a church now, and it was placed on a very high position. But as pilgrims, the caretaker allowed us to go and visit. You have to take a very narrow flight of stairs up to the top to be able to actually come into close contact of this Eucharist. And of course, one by one, the pilgrims went up and really paid a lot of time. And you can see that they were really reverentially praying to this Eucharist. Later on, in our reflection, I asked this question to the pilgrims. Is this host, the host that has turned to real flesh and blood, any different from the host that we receive week after week during Mass? So I'll pose this question to all of you too. Do you think that this host, the one that had turned to flesh and blood, is any different from the host that we receive? Who say yes? No? Not a single person? Who say no? Okay, a few. And the rest? I have no idea. Anyway, that's a very good Catholic answer. Huh? Yes, of course, there is a difference. Huh? The difference is that they have changed. The Eucharist have changed in form. But the answer is also no, because in essence, there is no difference. It is very much the body of Christ. And today's reading is a very good one to lead us to reflect on the real understanding of the Eucharist. Oftentimes, people, some people like to go around to go and visit all these Eucharist, Eucharistic miracles. But sometimes we get the reality uh, turned around. We get it upside down. All these Eucharistic miracles that is happening, that is the, not the only one. Huh? In fact, around the world you can find many. All these miracles are not to ask us to go out and to look for the extraordinary. But in fact, it is a reminder to each and every one of us that sometimes the seemingly ordinary, the host that we receive every week, after a while we might think that it is something that is very ordinary, it is in fact very sacred. So these miracles is to remind us that what we receive week after week, it is not something that is ordinary but very sacred. And for the, for the past three weeks, in fact, if you still remember, we have been reading a continuous passage from the Bible, from St. John's Gospel. It, has, it is the discourse of Jesus with the people to tell them that he is the bread of life. And this discussion actually happened after a very famous miracle, and that is the miracles of five loaves, and two fish, the multiplications of loaves. After this, Jesus has performed this miracle, the people were all very excited. They wanted to know, they wanted to follow Jesus. But Jesus wanted to tell them a very important reality, to tell them that don't come to me because you have seen me give you food. 
and this food do not last. So don't come to me for the food that do not last. But he tell them instead that I am the bread of life. You must come to me because I am the food that upon eating you will never go hungry. So you must come to me for the right reason, for knowing that I am the bread of life. And therefore, through today's reading, I would like to bring out two points for us to reflect. And the first one is that the Eucharist is the greatest act of love. And therefore, we need to keep coming to the Eucharist in order to come closer to Christ. Now, how do we come close to Christ? Of course, the only way to come close to Christ is to get to know Him. And we need to understand that to know Christ should not be taken as a chore. We should not whine and complain that, ah, ah, this is so hard and this is so difficult for me to get to know Christ. In fact, to know Christ is just like the process of falling in love. I see among you, there are probably many couples, husband and wife. There are probably many lovers, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend. And maybe some of you, you have someone that you hope can be your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your future spouse. Now, when we have that someone that we are in love or someone that we really like, that process of getting to know this person is definitely not a chore. In fact, it is a very joyful, it is a very wonderful experience. Right? Yes or no? Yes, okay, but not very enthusiastic, huh? But I'm sure it is a wonderful experience falling in love with someone. You want to get to know more about this someone. You want to know everything about this person. And those moments that you can be together, those are wonderful, treasured moments. Same goes. To know Christ, we have to go through this process. We have to go into prayer. This is a moment where we can have conversation with God to know God a little bit more and to allow God to know us a little bit more. We need to have those moments where we stop talking. We just look into each other's eyes to just feel that sense of connectedness with one another. This has to be done through reflection and meditation. We need to know about the person, the information about the person a little bit more. We can do that by reading the Bible, by understanding, reading all the different documents of the church. But most importantly and most privileged way, for a human being, for a couple, what is the most intimate moment? How can you come closest to one another? Now, of course, that is when we come into a physical union. Same goes. Jesus has given us a way for us to come into this absolute union with Him. And that is through the Eucharist. When we receive Christ into us, this is a moment of deep union for us with God. And in our gospel today, we read Jesus saying, For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. This is a reality that tells us when we receive the Eucharist, it is not just physically taking in the Eucharist, but it is in fact a union with Christ physically, and spiritually. And the second point, if we really understand this reality, that union with Christ by receiving the Eucharist, it has to lead to a growth in wisdom within us. In another word, if we are really coming into union with Christ week after week in the Eucharist, it has to lead us to understand what are essential in our, in our faith and in our life and what might be more non-essential, the secondary. And in the first reading and the second reading today, we read about this reality 
In the first reading of Proverbs, we read, Come and eat my bread, drink the wine I have prepared. Leave your folly and you will leave. Walk in the way of perception. In the second reading, St. Paul tells the Ephesians, Be careful about the sort of lives you lead, like intelligent and not like senseless people. These are all passages that tell us if we are people who receive the Eucharist, it needs to give us wisdom and to help us to move away from folly and foolishness. So the question we ask ourselves, are we still sometime living our lives with some folly or some foolishness? I'm going to give some example, and I have to give this in context. These examples that I'm giving is not saying that it is wrong. But sometimes when we overemphasize it, it becomes something that to us seems to be the most essential. But in fact, if we look at it wisely, they are not the most important things. What are these? For example, sometimes when we receive the Eucharist, we will be focusing in perhaps not the most important part. For example, the size of the Eucharist. So I ask all of you very honestly, if I give you one small piece and I give you a bigger piece and I say choose, which one would you choose? A lot of people, of course, you would be happy, right? If the priest later, if I give you a bigger piece of host, you will say, oh, today I got more blessing from God. Uh, but is that the right way to look at it? And sometimes we are so engrossed when there are some scraps that fell. Yes, we need to be very reverential to the host. But sometimes to the point that, oh, this thing fall on the ground and it is like really dirty ground, what do we do to it? Okay, I let your imagination go wild. Huh? Sometimes we can do some pretty silly things to the scraps of the Eucharist. And sometimes on who are the ones that is giving us the Eucharist. That is the most important one. How many of us here like to go to the priest to receive the Eucharist? Okay, no one dare to raise their hands, of course. But today, if I'm giving and then beside me is the bishop or the cardinal, who would you choose? Uh, if beside the cardinal is the pope, who would you choose? Yeah, of course. Yes, but we laugh at it. But we have to ask ourselves, are these the things that that is occupying our mind when we are receiving the communion. Even, I'm going to give one more extra, slightly sensitive example, in confession. Oftentimes, many people come to confession and sometimes I have a conversation with them. I say, why do you want to keep coming for confession? They say, Father, because I want to receive the communion. Very good answer. But if I continue to probe, why do you want to keep receiving the communion? If you keep probing, sometimes the answer is because I'm afraid to go to hell. Now, that is a valid answer. But my question is, is that the most, the, the most, how to say, good answer, the, the most essential reality of why we want to receive the communion? We want to receive because I am in love with God, and this is the greatest act of our union together. And we have to check ourselves sometimes when we receive Christ, when we receive the Eucharist, is this the reason why? And if we really know it, if this is the cause of it, it needs to change even our way of life. It has to affect the way we act the way we speak, the way we relate to one another, the way we make choices, the way we make decisions. In all, we have to ask, am I acting and living as someone who has eaten the bread of life? So once again, I'm going to give you some questions to ponder, all right? If today, if one of the hosts here turn into real body, real flesh, and real blood, will you revere this host any differently? Now, if a wise person really look at it, they would have the same amount of respect to the host, whether either it is in the form of bread or in flesh 
awe and blood. And also, it is important for us to realize that the important thing is the experience of Christ in our life when we receive the Eucharist and how we live our lives as people who has received the bread of life. If the Eucharist do not change our lives, if it doesn't change the way we talk, the way we act, the way we relate with one another, even every day we are eating a sacred host that has turned into flesh and blood. My dear brothers and sisters, it will not do us any good. So let us all ponder on this reality. Oh, Mary, how oh, I... Oh.